Following Hurricane Ian's landfall in Florida and the devastation wrought across the state by the same, we've seen a flurry of headlines from across the news spectrum about how all submerged EVs are ticking time bombs, with suggestions that all of them will erupt in flames just as soon as look at you. This has allowed particularly the right-wing press and also right-wing politicians like Senator Rick is this a bandwagon I can jump on, Scott, to run around like headless chickens repeating all the FUD, that's fear, uncertainty and doubt, that they can lay their hands on to all and sundry. So much so that we've had many of you ask, is this something that's really a concern? And given Senator Scott's decision to ask that all EV manufacturers should recall all EVs until there are sufficient safety measures in place to prevent these fires, end quote, we thought perhaps this is one we should address. Okay, after a vehicle's been submerged in water, be it salt water or not, it's unwise to assume that you can just get in and drive it. Believe me, our beloved Enfield 8000, my mum's much-loved little EV, got to experience a freshwater flood and, well, it was dead. Dead as some politician's souls, and that's how it ended up being written off by the insurance company before it eventually became the world's fastest street legal electric drag car, known as Johnny Smith's flux capacitor. Also, as a safety tip, freshwater flood is really a misnomer because the water in flooded areas is an unlovely mix of sewage, pollutants from factories, often mixed with petrochemical products, so yeah, unless you have to, don't go in it. But seawater is a particular menace to electrics and electronics and thus cars. While fresh water is not great for corrosion, salt water is particularly bad. The combination of oxygen, moisture and sodium chloride leads to a couple of processes that can cause metals to decay ten times faster than when dry, or at least at normal levels of humidity. The first is electrochemical corrosion, which is an interestingly circular process. Metal ions dissolve in salt water, making it more conductive, and then that conductive nature and those dirty stop-out metallic ions attract electrons from other compounds and the cycle continues. Then things get really fun, because if things are underwater for a substantial amount of time, particularly in the awful slurry that accompanies flooding, which is often filled with not a lot of oxygen and a lot of anaerobic bacteria, the corrosion that does occur often results in sulfates, which surround the metal. Hydrogen sulfide is often produced, which is highly corrosive, and the hydrogen that's released is used by bacteria, which also corrode the metal further. And for EVs and modern vehicles, which extensively use a variety of different metals, there's a bonus one. Galvanic corrosion can occur whenever two different metals with electrical continuity between them are in contact. You'll often find that modern efficient vehicles, most especially EVs, have a mixture of steel and aluminium, or aluminum if you prefer. Steel provides the strength and the aluminium the lightness. And when those two star-crossed lovers meet, aluminium generally becomes the anode and whatever else is there the cathode and the bath of nice salty water the entire car is resting in becomes a galvanic rusty mess. That green confederacy of unfortunateness means that cars that have been submerged in salt water have long been as unwelcome as a Magrathian delegation at an ethical capitalism convention when they come to salvage auctions. Regular salvage buyers know that salt water immersed cars are likely to be an endless catalogue of electrical failures and corrosion, beyond the fact they also often smell dismal. Practice salvage buyers also know that because modern engines often contain a lot of aluminium, or aluminum again if you prefer, that corrosion in and around the engine components might well be the death knell for the engine at the very least. So let's not pretend that gas cars come out unscathed. Worse, when submerged gas cars will usually lose their precious bodily fluids, namely gasoline and oil, adding pollution to the already unlovely mix of nasties that are around in flood water. So even if it looks like your car, gasoline or electric, might appear to have survived a flood, the problem is that it isn't a hermetically sealed object. If it's been submerged, it needs to at the very least be thoroughly checked over, because water can get into the many, many unseen connectors that lurk under the hood, under the car, within the dashboard, hidden within the bodywork. Some of those connectors might have watertight seals, but some don't, and those that don't will corrode. 
This is something that you see as cars age, eventually connectors in the car can become corroded and then you get those weird electrical faults that tend to crop up in older cars. Power windows only working intermittently or when the sun is shining. Doors that lock or don't lock when you expect them to and the dreaded something's wrong engine warning light. Often these minor intermittent faults can be down to a couple of pins in one connector just failing to seat properly anymore. And just like blowing in the Nest cartridge, incidentally don't do that, get an air duster and some contact cleaner, cleaning those components and sometimes a bit of a wiggle will get things working again. Imagine that but times every single connector or unsealed component in the car. Ah. I can hear someone saying, but what about the battery? What about when water gets into the battery? Let's start off by saying that back in 2017, NHTSA, that's the National Highway Traffic Safety Agency, issued a report catchly titled, Lithium Ion Battery Safety Issues for Electric and Plug-in Hybrid Vehicles. I'll link down in the doobly-doo to quote another excellent YouTuber. And lurking in it are the testing requirements for electric and plug-in hybrid vehicle batteries. And I'm going to stun you here, but they actually thought about what happens when a vehicle is submerged in water, say in a flood, you know, because that's their job. And so battery packs are tested, submerged. They, unlike the rest of the vehicle, are more or less hermetically sealed, thus preventing water entering, at least for a while. Obviously the length of time starts to play into things here as days go by and the chance of water and worse salt water eventually eking its way through a weak seal and finding its way into the pack does increase. It also obviously increases because in flood water the car isn't just sat still and relaxing in a nice spa bath. No, no, beyond the pollution derived chemicals attacking it there's also the debris which floats or is tossed around and which may damage cars and cars are often floatily dragged around and may impact curbs, rocks or other submerged debris, all of which does have the potential to damage the car and with it the battery pack and all of which could lead to the pack getting punctured. That said, packs are designed to withstand freeway debris impacts without being pierced so it's going to take a bit of a hit to get that pack open. But as Rich Rebuilds demonstrated a long time ago with his flood damaged Model S rebuild, salt water did manage to make its way into the pack and there it caused corrosion. But that car didn't catch fire, as most won't. But it is a possibility. Unsurprisingly fires after floods aren't just a problem that affect EVs. In fact back in 2018 in the port city of Savona in Italy, a storm surge which pushed seawater up high enough to at least partially submerge the cars on the quayside, uh, that salt water, it's thought, shorted the gasoline-powered car's auxiliary battery, which then exploded and caused a fire that spread across multiple cars. And that's a fire source that could be a problem for submerged EVs. Most but not all EVs sport a 12-volt auxiliary battery and it's quite possible a fire could start in the low-voltage system and left unchecked it's possible that could spread to the traction battery. Ideally then you require a fire service with the appropriate equipment and training to put that fire out safely. Equipment that it seems very few fire services in the US have invested in or been funded to invest in because it's clearly more important to force automakers to take all electric cars off the road than it is to train fire departments to use the methods that have been used in parts of Europe for more than a decade to carefully tackle electric vehicle fires without using infinite quantities of water. But again the reason for that is money. Perhaps that's because gas car fires are, as we know from statistical evidence, way more common on a per car and per mile basis. And at present they're the most common source of fires. Now whether EV fires are or will prove to be more common after flooding is a question that we still don't know the answer to. While Florida's Jimmy Petronas Florida's state fire chief, which incidentally in a Florida being Florida moment doesn't mean he's actually a fire chief with lots of experience in firefighting, it means he's the chief financial officer in Florida. Yeah, I, I know. Jimmy Petronas tweeted out that quote, There's a ton of EVs disabled from Ian. As those batteries corrode, fires start. That's a new challenge that our firefighters haven't faced before, at least on this kind of scale. Hashtag Hurricane Ian. End quote. 
While it's quite likely a significant number of EVs were disabled and I wouldn't want to hop in any of them and drive them, the question of how many have actually caught fire doesn't seem to be one that Jimmy wants to answer. At least, not to us. I contacted the Florida State Fire Marshal's office and asked because I could only at that point find one individual fire and then some rather nebulous reports of quote a number of houses burning down following electric vehicle fires and I was met with silence. Not even a polite out of office reply to the form on their website that allows you to ask questions. Searching news sites I managed to dig up at this point a couple of weeks from our little Jimmy's outburst there have been eight fires from a potential 4,100 electric vehicles that they think may have been submerged. That gives a fire rate of 0.19% of cars catching fire, which is not great when compared to the 0.025% of EVs that typically catch fire. But when we compare that to the number of gas cars that catch fire, the average for them is about 1.5% catching fire during their life, that's not after submersion, that's just generally. It suggests that maybe the state fire marshal's tweet was more like a publicity stunt for a wannabe politician with an axe to grind than a genuine attempt to warn people about a real risk. I don't want to minimise the loss here. I can't imagine what it might be like to be flooded and then have your house burned down. As I said earlier, my mother's old house was flooded in an almost certainly climate change related flood. It wreaked havoc on her life and caused an incredible amount of destruction. Adding on the potential for fire afterwards, it must just be horrendous. But those fires could just as easily have been caused by gas cars. So we're left with this. At the moment, we just don't know whether EVs really are a bigger risk of fire than gas cars after flooding. We just don't have the data points. To be safe, if you can, if you know your car, be it an EV, gasoline, diesel powered, has been flooded, then I'd move it away from structures. Make sure it's a safe distance from your home and let the insurance company deal with it and get back to the business of rebuilding your life. And that goes doubly if it's spent days underwater. It seems like the likelihood of a fire is small, but it's not zero. And I like minimising risk. That's it for today. Thank you so much for watching. If you liked the video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and don't forget to leave your thoughts below or in our free to join Discord chat room. There is a link down in the video description. And if you really liked it, why not leave us a super thanks? It's easy to do and everything you send goes towards helping us make great content. If you haven't already, make sure you're subscribed to this channel and our other channel Transport Evolve Take 2 and give the bell a gentle ring to make sure you're told when our next video goes live. And before I go, check out our regular sponsors at Unspun and Energy Sage. Links are also down there. And if you use either company and use the relevant codes listed below, you'll be helping us too. Thanks on behalf of the entire TE crew go out to everyone who makes this channel possible. That includes everyone who supports us on Patreon and YouTube, as well as those of you who just watch the video and share it. If you're a supporter at the Charged Up level, you'll see your name right here, on my right. And if you just joined, we're sorry if your name isn't showing yet. We currently render the list out every week or so, but sometimes our videos are produced a few weeks in advance. Thanks to our self-driving tier supporters, Mike Weeder, Patrick Boyarski, Chris Maxwell, Brian Newton, Michael Goad, Bennett Elder, Andrew Martin, Pedro Mura Pinheiro, Brophy Wolf, Chris and Michael Johnson, Tessa in the Gong, Dan Blair, Peter Dillinger, Gordon C, Stephen O'Donoghue, Kyle Hodgson, Anthony Coates, Regine Fellows, Denny Hyde, Chris Center, and Jim Burness. And of course, out of this world thanks to our Starman supporters, Andrew Glenn, Anonymous Freak, JP Fagerback, Joe Bresney, John Lyons, Rory Litwin, Kevin Burrowbridge, Laura Reynolds, Marcel Ward, Matthew Drobnak, Paul Conway, Reggie Watts, Will Graylin, and of course, Ian. If you want to be part of the amazing list, you can join Patreon at the link below, hit the join button below to support us on YouTube, or show us your support through Bitcoin, Kofi, or our cool swag store. Links down there. And if you're unable to support us financially, just know that watching the video and sharing it really makes a massive difference to how well our videos perform and keeps the algorithm quiet and happy. What? What do you mean you're never happy? 
Thanks for joining me, and as always, keep evolving!